Well, good evening, and uh, thank you for joining us for this first panel discussion with artists featured in the current Florida Prize in Contemporary Art. I'm Hanson Mulford. I'm uh, the chief curator at the Orlando Museum of Art, and I'm here with Coralie Clayson Glazen, who's our also our curator here at the museum. The the two of us uh, are the people who put the Florida Prize together every year. Uh, we're now in our seventh year. Uh, we've featured uh, 70 artists up to this point. Um, before we uh, uh, begin the discussion, I'd like to go over a few features for the Zoom webinar. Uh, the participant chat is the best place to share comments publicly with the group, uh, but questions uh, for the panelists can be asked through the Q&A. And to access this, it, it's, uh, there's a Q&A in the toolbar located at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, and if you put your questions in there, we'll address those uh, toward the end of the program. So today we're here with uh, Lauren Mitchell, uh, Robert Rivers, and Kedgar Volta. And uh, I thought we'd start with uh, talking uh, with to Lauren and uh, so welcome, Lauren. It's, uh, we, we, I guess we're going to show a few uh, visuals of the of your work that's included in the show. You can maybe uh, talk a little bit about, give us a little introduction to your work uh, and, and what what you've been showing in the prize. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me and being a part of Florida Prize this year. And I guess sort of last year <laughs> by default. Right. Sure. Um, so I moved to Florida about 12 years ago, I think. Um, and to be completely honest, it was the very last place I ever imagined that I would live. <laughs> um, my history of it was sort of Disney World trips and visiting my grandmother in Palatka. So I kind of <laughs> had a certain view of it. Um, and then I moved here uh, to be with my husband. And um, it was sort of this place that was kind of like a stepping stone to other kind of imagined places that we would move to eventually. So I sort of felt like it was this temporary place that I was biding my time in until I got some to somewhere better. <laughs> um, and, you know, as I as the years went by and I took on um, jobs and started working. Um, I, I and actually I lived on the Space Coast um, up until about almost two years ago. So um, I moved right around the sort of the middle point of the recession is when I arrived there and moving there um, and experiencing the Space Coast during that time, um, it was, you know, it was really interesting for me to experience that. Um, and it just felt like knowing, as I got to know the history of the place with NASA um, and you know everything, all the history that we have, um, you know, with the moon landing and um, you know, all the, the rockets and just all of space travel, um, it became apparent to me that living there it very much felt like I was living in the footsteps of what used to be. Mm -hmm. And um, so the more that I drove around um, the Space Coast and Brevard, um, the more I began to, I think it, it changed my perspective from, you know, sort of wishing I lived somewhere else to kind of this dual experience of still, you know, maybe not being happy with where I was, but learning to appreciate it. Um, and I think that that is still an important thing that I take with me when I photograph is just knowing that I can hold space for both experiences at the same time, mm -hmm. um, being, you know, appreciative um, and learning about a place and respecting it and knowing that it's somewhere that I call home, but at the same time, you know, learning a little bit more about the history and maybe having a more critical eye about certain things or, you know, just still yeah. not, some days not wanting to be there <laughs> at all. Some of the work, like the first one we looked at was very 
seemed very explicitly about that kind of rundown, shabby yes. uh, Bavard County uh, community, you know, so in, in contrast with, of course, the space program, which is, you know, America's kind of uh, one of our great achievements, I guess, but. Um, it, yeah, uh, I, yeah, so you, you've captured some of that, that spirit. And I was fortunate enough to see the very tail end of the space shuttle program. So I did get to witness that. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of these images, you know, most of them um, are images that come from the neighborhoods that I lived in. The very yes. first are the one with the, the rocket trail and my daughter who figures a lot into these photos. Um, you know, that was just up the street from my house. So they're very, very personal to me. Right. So one of the things I think we, we really appreciated or liked, liked about your work was that uh, it seemed like that you were always on the lookout for uh, spotting things that were visually intriguing. Uh, uh, like for instance, this kind of very ordinary uh, scene we see every day uh, around Central Florida. You're, you're actually in Central Florida now. And um, you know, this kind of odd landscape we live in where it's everything's sort of built out and nature is confined to you know, a, a narrow space between curbs uh, in a lot of areas. But, but you, 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 as you sort of go about your daily life, you're always kind of catching these sometimes absurd, whimsical qualities of, of what, what's around us every day. Yeah, I think just by default, um, I guess it's, I think that's maybe how I process some of, you know, what I learn about, what I've learned about Florida is through humor and just sort of pointing out the, just the things that I find interesting or I guess humor is in a, in a sort of dark way. Um, but I, I, I just, you know, the more I learned about Florida and, and living here, you know, and just experiencing it, you know, you, you begin to understand that, you know, people have come here as like to seeing it as a paradise, but really, you know, the reality of Florida versus the expectation of Florida is completely different. And the natural landscape of Florida is, you know, not the paradise that I think people have come, like when they came here, they got something completely different. And so they, completely reshaped it and reshaped Florida and altered it to become something that, you know, they had in their mind. Um, yeah, this, so this is one of the pictures that I, I think was, I, I was particularly interested in mm -hmm. when, I was, when we were looking at your work with this, you know, again, it's a picture of almost nothing, but, it, but uh, a lot of us would just sort of drive by that without noticing it. But I think the capturing that uh, strange uh, pattern of, uh, uh, tire tracks, obviously people have been doing wheelies around this vacant lot and it makes kind of a beautiful drawing on the pavement, but you're basically got a, a vacant area, which is sort of a, a, a failed development, it looks like, mm -hmm. uh, yep. which is so common in Florida. Yep, another aftermath of the recession. Right. Well, let's go, go on to uh, uh, Talk to uh, Robert. Hello, Hello Robert. Rick. How are hey. you? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> uh, we have a, a picture here of a, a segment of the drawing that you've been working on for a number of years um, that we uh, in, put in the into the exhibition. Uh, just to give a little background, we the the, the drawing I think is uh, somewhat over five hundred feet at this point, and we've got uh, about a uh, hundred and some feet, I guess, uh, uh, 180 feet. 189, yes. 189 feet, okay. 189. Okay. So we, in, in installing the work, we, uh, you brought over most of the drawing, which you've been working on for three or four years, and we laid a lot of it out and, and, and ended up uh, selecting this section of it, which I think was, uh, you know, very effective, a, a, a significant part. Mostly, I think most of this uh, part of the of the drawing was done in, in the last year or so, I guess, as I understand. Right. Um, <clears throat> actually, um, 
I started it in October 2018, I think, is when I started. I, I had done the 22 by 30 inch drawings. I'd done like 450 of those uh, starting in about 2010. And then one day I just started taping them together. And it just went on from there. And that was in October after the faculty show of 2018 that I came in and started joining them together. And then I think you guys came over before the pandemic. And that was the first time that I'd gone through all of them was with y'all. I'd never mm -hmm. seen it kind of laid out. And I think that we only had about what, uh, gosh, let me see, I can tell you I, how many panels that we looked at that day. I think we stopped at uh, panel number 70. Mm -hmm. And so now we have, I have 237 panels. Mm -hmm. And so y'all had seen the first 70 and then you called me after we were getting ready to do this. And I brought my notorious scroll, which was made from my cell phone and putting it through the printer and we rolled it out. You said that you were more interested in seeing some of the new stuff. And I, I, I really appreciated, we brought the whole, the whole nine yards over and the students that, that were really interested in seeing part of it wanted to help me lay it out. And we laid it out for, for you and Coralie. And I really, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and watch you. And, and I think y'all did a marvelous job curating. I mean, I, I was- It, it, was, it was very difficult. <laughs> it was difficult to pick because everything was good. So making a selection was very hard. Just uh, we have a, a few, um, yeah. Good. Go ahead. I, I thought it was, I'm glad it was difficult because it was hard to pick instead of saying hard to find something good. That's just, you know, but I really, I really had a great time. And that was the first time talking about this. And I think we went out to eat with the kids and everything. The, the guys that were helping me hang, helping me hang, helping us shift it around. That's the first time I've eaten in a restaurant in over a year when we went in and sat down. So the whole thing was kind of really refreshing for me after being clustered for so long. Just to give a little background, uh, the, the, the work began uh, uh, because of, uh, or is inspired by, or is a result of, in, of, your, of uh, the fact that your nephew was killed in Afghanistan. He, he was a Marine. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, killed in, uh, what year what was it, 2013? No, he was killed uh, April 28th, uh, 2010 in Helmand mm -hmm. province. And, yeah. uh, you know, he's a young guy that uh, worshiped my father, who was also a Marine. And we, I come from sort of a semi-military family. My, my father flew B-25 bombers during World War II and then worked for NASA. And so the first time I came to Florida, I used to come down with my dad and I got to see uh, you know, John Glenn go up and Alan Shepard. He knew all these guys. He's a, he, he worked under Von Braun and I used to sh sit at Von Braun's desk in Huntsville, Alabama and make drawings. Well, you know, when you grow up in Alabama, the idea of being an artist is not, it's not like you're getting to play quarterback for the University of Alabama. It's a total, you know, it's sort of a weird thing. So that I never really thought I'd ever be an artist. And I did a stint where I was training elephants and, and, uh, and, you know, I was drawing the whole time. I never quit drawing since I was five, but the idea that I was going to be an artist, I wanted to do something with animals. I wanted to, and, and then all of a sudden I was at Auburn and I was studying and took a drawing class and made an A in it. And I guess that changed the whole course of my life. Well, this panel that we're looking at, I think, uh, kind of really sets the some of the tone of, of the drawing, which I think I, I assume that the figure on the left is is your nephew or uh, represents just that. Be a, a symbol of a soldier. I tried. I try to kind of. It, it's almost like when you look at the the frieze of the Greek soldiers, the Elgin marbles in the British Museum, where they have. I wanted to have individual individuality but be of the same ilk yes. 
and and so the the features all simply sort of change and it's not like a portrait of thomas i've not done yeah. that i've not okay i've you know i've not sat there and said oh i'm going to draw thomas now i i intentionally not did that i wanted to sort of make them i wanted them to have not a military uniform but the uniform that that the idea of the what you wear when you're in the barracks or you're hanging out and you're joking around as guys and you wear your t-shirt and your pants and you and you have your your boots on because and mostly they're probably unlaced and you know you're relaxing and horsing around that was the kind of and at the same time that sort of moment when you go on guard that moment like uh, you know my friends in Vietnam would say wow, we'd be sitting around and all of a sudden they'd be blowing the horns and we'd be picking our rifles up, but we weren't in military, you know. I thought about that a lot, you know. It, um, but, and then I started, this is the barracks, part of the barracks and mm -hmm. sort of probably multiple figures stacked in the bed. You can't really tell which figure is which and some of the faces have two or three faces implanted on it. The idea that there's multitude of these kids going through here, um, I get. I guess that's part of it. Yeah, and uh, you, uh, you've uh, been working for teaching at the university for over forty years. I know, and very interested in the history of art, and I, I think that is also evident in the this drawing. It seems almost like you everything that you've kind of learned or gathered or treasured over the last decades, you've kind of put into this thing uh, in, in terms of references to all kinds of, you know, art historical references as well as just cultural references dealing with uh, the afterlife, the underworld, the, the sort of life of the spirit of the soul traveling in time or place. It all seems to be kind of compiled from all different sources here. I don't know if you've ever read Gravity's Rainbow. I, I know that the one that, it was a big deal for me to read Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, it, the big deal was that I had kind of gone through education trying to be a football player and I'd really not learned as much as I should. And when I went to the University of Georgia, I've worked for an art director, worked as an art director for a couple of years after graduating Auburn um and i suffered under it i chafed under it 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 wasn't my it wasn't my cup of tea you know and i finally got back into georgia to study printmaking and although i'd only had two printmaking courses in my life you know so i showed up with a stack of drawings they took me in as an unclassified postgraduate and they promptly put me in this guy's class to take an un, uh, undergraduate course in figure drawing and he was at the opening. That was one of the powerful moments that Robert Broker came to that opening. And um, he was a, he was an ex-Marine. And, you know, but he was reading this, he had read this book, Gravity's Rainbow, and he would talk about it. And I remember getting the book and reading it. And it was one of the hardest things I ever did. It was, right. you know, half the judges could not finish it in 1973, although it won the National Book Award. So I struggled reading this and I learned so much. I had to research it. And I realized that's what a university is about, is teaching you, not teaching you facts, but teaching you how to go out and find these things. And what was really pleased me about when y'all chose this it's not unlike Gravity's Rainbow, where you can pick that book up and it makes as much sense if you open the book in the middle and start reading to the end that as it does if you start in the beginning and read to the end. You can always right. pick it up, read a segment, flip through the book, read another segment. Mm -hmm. That makes as much sense as that. So the narrative is not like telling a story. It's not this, yeah. you know, and I, it, and when you start, we start uh, feeling kind of psychotic. You have to stop reading it. That's right. It, right. <laughs> you, have, you don't read it as right. you read it yeah. like you're reading right. prose. 
some sort of strange poetry. Yeah, right. And and it has a symbolism. There's a guy from Florida State that wrote about Gravity's Rainbow, a page to page guide. And uh, I started to I, I kind of didn't finish that. I kind of liked reading it and having the mystery and the wonder. And this, of course, this the barracks. I was doing this. I did a print in 1976 in Cortona, Italy. And it was very influenced by Kleinholz's insane asylum of the two men in the bed and the, you know, the actual sculpture. Yeah. And I did this Cortona hospital print and that sort of had a crucified figure being held up by a nurse and a doctor. And then behind it, it had this stacked bed with these two men withering in this bed, twisting and withering. And another person, another two people sitting on a bench and a person that was a nurse, yet her hat looked like devil horns reading a clapboard to them. And so I've been doing, I've been doing these sleeping figures, uh, you know, throughout the last 30 years, 40 years. And so, you know, I, I, I just keep re reassessing this stuff over and over again. Thank you. And Robert, mm -hmm. the piece is unfinished. You're still working on the piece, right? Yeah, I've, I've got nine nine more panels here at the house that that I'm got in various stages. One on my drawing board right now that that is uh, the underdrawing, and then two downstairs that have already started getting the coats and the paint and all that stuff. But yeah, I keep right on moving. Yeah. Well, thank you, Robert. Let's, let's talk to uh, Kedgar. Hello, Kedgar. Hello, hello. Uh, first of all, I'm going to apologize in case you hear some strange noises in the background. I'm in a public place right now, and sometimes the Florida soundscape gets really, really interesting. Yeah. Sounds so pretty good, that. though. I think you're doing all right. I think it sounds okay. good. Perfect. Um, okay. So I am originally from Cuba. I moved to the States in 2008, and I'm, I graduated from design school in Cuba, graphic design. And my first inclination towards art came through photography. My father was a photographer and quickly it started evolving into something that I was not very much capable of doing. I wanted to incorporate the, the, the guests, the people looking at the work as being active or participants of the work. Um, and, and some of the ideas that I was having were levitating towards that. And that required um, and knowledge of something that I didn't have is, is computer knowledge and, and, and software development knowledge and, and code as a way of, of create, making something creative and eventually code and, and programming and development became my brush, became my camera, became the way I will create the things that I had in my mind. Um, in, in the particular pieces that are currently at the Florida Price exhibit, um, one of them was started in 2015 and it's the video, the video part of it, the, the piece is called Recollection. At the time, I really didn't know what was gonna happen with the video. I just felt that I needed to document, going back to Cuba, document the places that were familiar to me. So, so I went there, rented a car and I basically put a camera on the window and I recorded everywhere I went. Um, not really having an intention behind it at that point, but it, it was the, 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 the beginnings of, of an idea. Uh, that footage sat there for a long time. And then in 2020 with, with COVID over, we, were, we had planned to go to Cuba, my wife and I, and, and we couldn't make it. Of course, traveling was impossible. So at that point, it felt that the right time to pick up that footage again and remembering looking back at the, at the footage and, and remembering what, what it is, what it used to be for me, what the places that I drove by meant for me, what the destinations meant for me, then it was the experimental process began, right? The, the painting began with code in, the, in this case to create a piece that was reflective of that time or that particular experience. Um, the other piece in the exhibit is called the, oh, we're still here. Um, so here what happens is that there's, there's a random randomness of the way we remember things and, and how memories come to life in our mind. 
sometimes they're very structured. Sometimes they are somehow cha cha uh, chaotic. And they stack in a way that may or may not make sense, but they come to you in a, in a, in a randomness kind of way. So the, the algorithm behind them, the code behind it, what it does is that it, it randomly sort through, um, I think it's over 150 clips, more than three and a half hours of footage. It randomly picks different um, clips and then decomposes and restacks again and, and arrange in a, in a timeline kind of matter. So towards the left of the frame, things start to decompose more. They start to depart from reality even more. The same way memory as time goes by gets more detached from the actual reality. Um, and then towards the right, we have the, the closer thing, which is, which is the video. Um, and what is quite interesting for me is that in the process of learning to create the things that I wanted to create, I had to make the choice of not creating any work. So from about 2015 to about 2017 or 2018, um, for, for two or three years, I basically didn't do any more shows, didn't do any more exhibits. Um, I was studying and completely immersed in, in, in learning how to craft, how to learn my craft. And I'm, I'm really happy that the opportunity to present it to get back out there and, and put into practice the things that I wanted to do. And for a long time, since I wasn't creating it, I was still writing the ideas down. And, and I know some of them eventually will find their way into, into work. Uh, this particular piece was originally commissioned or, or it was originally created for MoCA Jacksonville for the Atrium project space. Um, at the time that I got the invitation to create something for the space, I felt very fortunate that after about 10 years of emigrating to the United States, I, I was in a place in which I was invited to create something for the museum, uh, contemporary art in Jacksonville. And reflecting in that particular moment, I, I realized that it, it, there's only a small percentage of that that is, can be completely attributed to the individual. There's a huge percentage of anybody's success that has to do with the opportunities that have been presented to you by all the people in your community. So there's a lot of influence by whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's coworkers, whether it's a boss, it doesn't really matter. There's, we're not an island. We are surrounded by people that um, support us at certain uh, points in our lives. So deep is aimed as a tribute to that. The idea was to create a space in which you are the center of that space and every single light that, is, uh, that surrounds you represents basically this community, this, this life outside of yourself, all these people that are related to you, whether it's directly or indirectly, and how they come on and off. They activate at certain moments in, life to, in your life to, to allow you to accomplish something. So it's a tribute to that. Um, also, the, the piece is, has a recognition that the viewer is there although the viewer cannot retain control of how the lights behave. Um, in, in the same way we have, there's all these sources of powers outside of our control that we, that we, 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 can, we have certain impact over them in the same way they have an impact over us, but we, we cannot control them. So the idea here is that there's a, is, I want people to have a moment of reflection, have a spot in which they can reflect of all this, uh, that they're surrounding and Hopefully, it's an experience that is meditated to an extent, and that's uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, in, in, in this particular installation, the pieces are not related. There, there are two distinctive pieces, pieces, the fragility of the promise and the projection that is titled Recollection. But because of the size of the space and the proximity of these two pieces, I also wanted to have a conversation between the two, the two um, pieces of work. So the behavior of the lights in this case affects how the memories is collected or recollected. And the, um, the way the photos present themselves and the memory stacked on this particular piece also affect the way the lights behave. Um, of course, if they're installed separately, that's gonna go away. But, but that connection between the things that surround me, whether it's space, it's people, it's work, to me is, is very important. Um, so that's how this exhibit came to be, basically.
in, in case for anybody who hasn't seen the exhibit, it, it may be hard to read it in the photographs here, but uh, what, you, what you were looking at is a, a really massive uh, uh, construction that, that holds these LED lights up in the air. Uh, they're probably almost about 25 feet wide at the, I believe roughly 25 feet wide circle of lights and they're just you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them. And they kind of come and as, as Craig says, they, they flash on and off at various times. So kind of fade, fade in and out. Um, the, the piece is called The Fragility of the Promise. And the title seems quite interesting to me in a way that even the, the promise of delivering this piece when it was originally created for Mocha Jacksonville um, was really not possible without having the collaboration of a lot of people in the community. I pull a call out um, because the amount of work, every single component of these over a thousand lights were cre was created by hand. So the amount of hours that was dedicated to this project was incredibly high and it was developed in a very short time. So I put a call out to the community and I had dozens and dozens of people showing up and helping anybody from kids that were under 10 years old to senior citizens were, sitting, were all sitting at the same table, um, just creating the work and soldering people that had certain ability on that or, or gluing things or passing wires through, through pipes and just the process itself of, of activating the community to make a piece dedicated to the community and dedicated to, dedicated to the people that I have had in my life at, at some time, just, just in the process of creating the work itself became inseparable from the meaning of the work. And, and that almost came in as an accident. It wasn't really planned that way, but um, I think he's, to me, one of the most successful uh, experiences that I've had in creating any kind of work. Yeah, I think the... Uh... In the last slide, you could the, the video at the bottom seemed very tiny, but actually it's it's 16 feet wide. Uh, uh, you're, you're we're looking at it from a distance, but the two the two together I think work beautifully. Uh, they even though they are separate pieces, they seem to have a, a definitely have a dialogue or visual connection with each other, uh, and, and both being meditative. I think and. Uh, sort of there's a sense of kind of peace and thoughtfulness as you, you stand there uh, in the dark uh, surrounded by these these lights and this watching this video which uh, again without seeing it in person uh, these videos are constantly moving along from uh, right to left and compressing as, as they go and then you know fading out and then going going away and and new scenes are coming coming constantly. Uh, it's uh, just a and very both, uh, moving uh, experience. Both, they also both um, are very meaningful in uh, acknowledging the presence, both of people. You know, you, you described uh, the fragility of the promise and how people have helped you create the piece. But also in this one, in recollections, the presence of people that are passing by, you know, it's kind of really meaningful and they fade away in the kind of a similar fashion, you know, a similar way. Um, because the camera was basically fixed on the window of the car as I was driving by. And, and these locations are the locations that I frequent. The, the, the image that is there right now it's actually from the, the small town where my grandparents used to live at. Um, and, and because of that, even people from my family ended up making it into the footage. As I was arriving, let's say, to my grandmother's house, somebody will come out and welcome me. And they didn't even know. And they ended up being part of the, of the piece. Um, I just I, I drove by my wife one time. I was leaving her house. She had gone to a friend's house and she's walking on the sidewalk and I just pass her. And, and just to me, that makes the, the piece much more meaningful because inadvertently they are there, which, which is you know, part of mm -hmm. that recollecting, the recollection component that I wanted to bring back with the piece. Well, thank you very much for introducing us to your work. Um, I guess uh, we could just ask some general questions, maybe that you all, anybody could uh, sort of chime in to uh, talk about. Uh, and perhaps uh, 
you, you could tell us a little bit about what, how you feel about, you know, carrying on a professional career as, as an artist in Florida. Uh, has that uh, is, been helpful or challenging? Um, what, what do you think about trying to maintain a career in Florida as an artist? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I guess I'll speak up. Uh, I have a great friend, Key Francis, who lived here many years and was actually our director for a while, professional artist. Florida is a tough place. I'll tell you why. A lot of the people that come down here are coming down from other places. They lived in New York, Chicago, places like this. And they're trying to de-access their art collection. They're not trying to collect an art collection. And so you, a lot of the people that are very sophisticated about the arts are, are, are kind of getting rid of it. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Key Francis. I, I've never looked at my art as sort of commercial, so I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but as far as me, 40 years of it, I mean, I found it to be a great place a great place because it gives you just the right amount of resistance and the right amount of support to, to get in your studio and make art. And, and I, I, you know, I think I've, I, I think I couldn't be in a better place. Great. Um, I, yeah, I think I'm sort of, I don't know. I feel like I'm coming at it from sort of a reverse perspective. <laughs> um, so I, so I have, you know, just a nine to five, like I, I'm a graphic designer. So I feel like I'm kind of coming at the art world maybe through like the back door <laughs> or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, you know, I just, I, I can't speak for any other communities around Florida, but I know that, you know, within Orlando, um, it's been a very positive environment um, you know, within the art community. And, um, you know, I, I've been really fortunate to meet some really great people. Um, you know, it's definitely something that I don't, I can't speak to from a career perspective since my career is, I mean, it's, it's similar, but different. Um, but, you know, being involved in the community itself, um, I've, I really enjoyed that. Okay, Gar, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? that? I know you're in Jacksonville, which is uh, Robert and Lauren are both here in Central Florida. How is Jacksonville? So I'm, I'm in the same page as, as Lauren. Um, I, although I practice art very regularly, I, I don't make a living out of art. I, I don't really think of living as an artist and making um, a financially stable life is easy anywhere. Um, that being said, though, I, I I don't really think a place conditions creativity. I think uh, even, even Lauren Works is a perfect example of that. Even being slightly reluctant to live in Florida, now she has found inspiration on that. I think there's inspiration everywhere. And we, we currently live in a global society too, which we have access to many things that are happening around the world. So if there's something that your particular location lacks, you can, you can definitely find somewhere else. I think, um, I personally have been very fortunate living in Florida, and um, I think there's quite quite a lot of opportunities there. So I, I haven't lived in any of the states so far, so I can necessarily yeah. compare, say if one is better than another one. Okay. I know that uh, in our experience of look, looking, uh, you know, working on this exhibit for you know, years, uh, it's certainly uh, it, it's uh, difficult for artists uh, to, to you know, make a living. I mean, some, uh, some artists do, but uh, it's very hard to make a living just producing your artwork uh, in part because I, mean, I think that there are so few collectors, rel I mean, relatively few collectors in Florida, particularly for the size of the state. And, and um, uh, you know, most, a lot of the kind of commercial or gallery uh, activity and collectors are in South Florida when you get past South Florida, 
it gets even tougher, I think, for a lot of artists. I mean, many of them uh, are teaching at universities or uh, finding, a, you know, working in other fields to support themselves. Uh, you know, so anyway, it's, a, it's a, as you say, it's tough everywhere probably, but uh, you know, things are, are changing now. So I mean, hopeful the future will uh, make it easier. Coralie, do you have any thoughts on this? So we have a question actually. We have, um, the question is, can you describe a turning point in your career? And that can be anyone. <laughs> I know I was trying to think like what, I think that there's different, different points. I don't know if there's one particular point where, you know, I felt like I had made um, a big change or I noticed, you know, a, a big difference. Um, I think, you know, as I mentioned, um, when I was you know, talking about the photos, um, shifting my own personal perspective about my surroundings. I think it made a huge difference for me. Um, and I think that very much opened up my eyes to what was around me in a way that I could, you know, photograph it. Like I said, in that kind of like appreciative and loving place, but also sort of a critical place at the same time. Um, so that was definitely a big thing for me. Um, and then also, you know, becoming more involved in the arts community here in Orlando, um, like, you know, with, uh, Patrick and Holly over at SNAP, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to work with them. Um, so yeah, those, yeah. I would think those for sure. They've been a big impact on central Florida, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, galleries. We have very few galleries in central Florida, commercial galleries. And, I think that's a really important to uh, supporting the arts in, in various ways. But, uh, Ken Garb, didn't you go to art school in, in Havana? Uh, no, I went to design school. Oh, design school, okay. Which is, is I, I find it, it prepares you in a very different way. And okay. um, therefore I think I look at art and, and art as a practice in, in my own way, I have built my own way, I guess. Um, that makes a little better work, just mine. Um, yeah. So uh, as a turning point, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess it depends what the ambition is as a turning point of, of making your art commercially viable. I, um, in that case, I, I, that's not really what I'm looking for. My, the opportunities that I seek are about creating a and presenting the work because I don't have the need to sell to make a living, which is my particular case. So as long as I have those opportunities, I feel that I'm accomplishing what I want. Um, I think I was very fortunate in 2014. If anything, I would call that a turning point when uh, Crystal Breeze's Museum of American Art did a national search for artists and selected a hundred artists to participate in, a, in an exhibit um, of contemporary art. And I was fortunate enough to um, have been selected for that exhibition. So yeah. if anything, I would I would call that particular point a turning point into the kind of opportunities that presented to me after that. Yeah, that was seemed like a very pretty significant uh, exhibition to be included in. Yeah. Uh, really a sur survey of artists all over the United States. I think you were only two representing Florida, maybe, I think. Only two of them, and both of them were from Jacksonville, actually. Yeah. Hiromi, Monihun, and myself. Yeah. Great. So what do you think is the significance of a show like the Florida Prize for Central Florida or for Florida? I can only speak for, you know, when my teacher came down, Robert Croker, who had worked at DIA, he worked at the Guggenheim, whose wife was the director of a museum in Philadelphia that I don't know. 
And he walked in and viewed the show. And he said, this is top notch. This is a beautiful museum. They do everything top class. So to be included in that meant a lot to me. I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, I think we really tried. I mean, that's what, one of the goals of this exhibition has been to uh, present, you know, artists that we think are just doing excellent work, working at a very high level uh, and, and, and present them in a way that they would be uh, shown in, in, a, in a New York uh, museum or gallery or whatnot it is, you know, to, to, to create a, an exhibition or presentation that, that's as equal to the quality of the work that's being shown, I think, which is often, sometimes doesn't always happen with uh, uh, Florida themed art uh, you know, exhibitions. Uh, anyway, so hopefully we're doing some, some good for the artists who participate. As far as I think you guys did a great job. I just thought the, the, I thought the display was wonderful. And what Croker who worked for his, what, what he, he's worked for Dia, which they established all these outlandish artworks, the lightning fill, he was part of this, he was part, um, Walter D. Romero was his best man when he got married, the broken kill meter, he put that in, established that, he came in and walked through your museum and said, this is first class, this is really top notch. Well, it's, and, and I- it's The artists that make the show, so I'm glad you got no, no, no. I'm going to tell you, you guys were a delight to work with. I had so much fun. I hope I didn't bore your ass to death having to look through all of them drawings. But I mean, and my students and colleagues that helped me, they just thought, they just thought y'all were wonderful. And I know. Great. Well, thank you for saying that. I think we'll... Uh... We have another question oh, for okay. Ted Gallagher. Okay. Yeah, for Kate Gardes, and the, the question is from Susan Patterson. The question for Kate Gard, your work is beautifully complex. The images and memories from the three and a half hours of footage, are they in a random flow and order, or are they programmed in a specific pattern? So, at first, when I was creating the work, I edited, um, I don't know, about 15, 20 minutes of that footage, and it felt, if I felt that that was wrong because that's, that's, there's a pre predefined or predetermined order if I were to do it that way. So what I ended up doing is just to, you can imagine there's, there's a folder with all possible clips and the, the, the algorithm behind it determines which one comes next. And, and there's different variables that determine what comes next, but there's a big one of them is random. So um, the entire order is established once all the, the clips have been already played. Um, so you, you, it's guaranteed that for over three hours, you're not going to see the same clip twice. So yeah, there's, there's a, a big random component there. And even when the clips flow in, the computer or the algorithm uh, deals with it differently every time, right? The kind of compression is different. It does. Even if the same clip were to repeat constantly, the way it's stacked and recomposed, it, it will be different. Mm -hmm. I thought that was another very poignant um, piece, actually, you know, because of the, the way memories work. And there's those moments that appear very clearly in your mind and stay with you like forever. And you have that in the work, you know, it's very visibly clear. And then there's moments, you know, they fade away, including the, the passes by or those homes, you know, so that I thought that was a very moving piece as well. Okay. Well, I think we'll say good, good evening. And uh, thank you all for participating uh, in this uh, panel discussion. Um, I'd like to just tell everybody who's watching that uh, our next panel discussion will be on Thursday, uh, July 15th at 6 p.m. Uh, and it will include the artists Matthew Cornell, Richard Hype, uh, Clara Varis, and it will be moderated by one of our jurors, Aaron Levy-Garvey. Um, so if you have a chance to tune into that, please do. And thank you again. Um, 
Lauren and Kedgar and, and Robert for participating, taking this time to share your ideas and thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Thanks.